Good morning. It is a real joy to be with you again this morning. And on behalf of the Southwestern Texas Synod, I bring you greetings. And I give thanks to God for your partnership in the gospel in this part of our territory. You have been making God's love real here for over 43 years. And I am grateful for your gospel witness and for your generosity in sharing your resources with the wider church. We are so much better together than we could ever be on our own, so thank you. Now I have to confess that it is hard for me to say in a cheery voice, the gospel of the Lord, when we get to this part of the church year. Because we get all these parables about the second coming of Christ, the end times, that sure don't sound like very good news, at least not for everyone. We've been hearing about wedding banquets where people are shut out, and a vineyard owner who puts people to a miserable death, and wise and foolish bridesmaids. And now this week, a slave is cast into darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Where's the good news in that? Well, I want to dwell for a time in what Jesus is talking about when he refers to the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God as he does throughout these end times parables. It's an odd term for us as Americans because didn't we fight a revolution so that we wouldn't have to be part of a kingdom? And our country was founded on the principle of religious freedom, which meant that people are free to believe what they want without having to do or believe whatever the king or prince of the territory believes. Contrary to what gets thrown around these days as well about being a Christian nation, our country was formed in a way that you don't even have to believe in Jesus. You can have your beliefs, and I can have mine, as long as they don't impinge upon each other's freedoms, right? So Christianity in our country became more about me and Jesus and my individual relationship with him. And the focus of being saved was so that you could get into heaven and avoid hell, right? Now, I like to read the comics. Any of you like to read the Sunday morning comics? Yay. Well, in the comics, heaven is often portrayed as a place that's up there somewhere, right? With St. Peter standing guard at the pearly gates. And so if you get in, you get to float around on what? White fluffy clouds, right? That's heaven. And if you don't get in, well, you're ejected to the bad place where the devil stands there with a pitchfork and welcomes you into the place of eternal fire. Now, to be fair, there are some verses, verses in Scripture that talk about outer darkness or heaven, but Jesus never really talked about life after our individual deaths. What Jesus does spend a lot of time talking about throughout his ministry is the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven, which he describes as a whole new system of government with him as the leader, a new world order, and a renewal not only of the world, but of the entire cosmos. Now, we don't spend much time on these texts about Christ's return, except at the end in the beginning of the church year. So it can be convenient for us to forget about that part. After all, Jesus told his followers he'd be back soon. And now over 2,000 years later, right, we're still waiting. But in our creed each week, we say that Jesus will do what? Come again to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. And here's the thing, this new world order, this kingdom or reign of God actually started when Jesus first came to earth. And he began to tell and show the world what this new world order 
and God's values are like. Now the people of God, the Israelites, at the time that Jesus came, had hoped and imagined that salvation looks something like their Messiah as a Marvel superhero, kicking the behinds of the Roman oppressors and restoring them to their former glory with a king and vast territories of land. But it didn't happen that way, did it? Instead, their savior went around hanging out with those on the margins, the last and the lost and the least. He healed the sick and drove out demons. He humanized the dehumanized and welcomed those whom society rejected. The good news that Jesus proclaimed was not a return to the past, nor a future on fluffy white clouds, but this new world order where the last will be first, where the meek and the merciful and the peacemakers and the persecuted will be the first to see God face to face. Where God's values of justice and mercy and love and forgiveness would reign rather than the world's values of retribution and war and he who has the gold makes the rules. And that was a huge threat to the religious and political powers of the time. So they hung Jesus on a cross to try to silence him. But God raised Jesus from the dead, right? And in doing so, showed the world that there was nothing that God couldn't or wouldn't do to save the world God loved to bring about God's reign of justice and mercy and peace and love and wholeness. So now, we come to this very familiar passage today, the parable of the talents, that we often use to encourage sharing whatever gifts we've been given for the sake of others. And I wonder if we might hear it in a bit of a different way today. What if the master in this parable is not God, but rather a metaphor for the way the world works, where super productivity at all costs is the highest good, and money is to be made as much as possible, even if it means sacrificing ethics? And now the first two slaves in that story then have bought into these values, maybe out of self-preservation. But this third slave, well, he decides he's not going to participate in this death-dealing economy. And so as a result, he is cast into the outer darkness. In verse 29, we hear, for to all who have, more will be given. And even from, from those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken away. Friends, that's kind of the reality we live in in today's world, isn't it? The rich keep getting richer, and the poor often find that even what they have is taken away. Now, according to the values of God's kingdom, though, where is Jesus in this parable? He's hanging out in the outer darkness with the slave. He's reminding him that he is beloved by God, that his worth is not tied up in anything he does or doesn't do, and that this is not the way it will always be when Christ returns. Now, as followers of Jesus, we too are beloved by God, not because of anything we do, but because of who God is. And we already know how things are going to turn out in the future when Christ returns, right? We get to embrace, then, those kingdom values of love and mercy and justice and wholeness right now. And we get the privilege 
of being a part of showing and telling others what Jesus has already started bringing about and will bring about completely whenever it is that he returns. That's why God formed the church, friends, to live into this new world order and these kingdom values right now. That's what you're doing here at Abiding Presence as you declare in words and deeds that you are a place of grace where what? All are welcome. And you are feeding the hungry and caring for those who are experiencing pain and illness and loss. You are being the people of God and showing forth God's values. And as ELCA Christians in this part of Texas, we as a synod believe that proclaiming these kingdom values mean that we are being and becoming a network of spirit-empowered communities of disciples called and sent to live out the radically inclusive gospel of Jesus through the promises of baptism. Think about the context in which we live, friends. We are the synod with the longest border with Mexico, where migrants are flowing across every day to escape violence, hunger, poverty, and death in their own home countries. They're often dehumanized, treated like pawns in political games. These are some of the people that God is calling us to share those kingdom values of love and mercy and compassion with. So our work with migrants in Eagle Pass, here in San Antonio, and around the whole church is part of a network of welcome and care for these beloved children of God. And in our territory as well, Gay, lesbian, and transgender persons are persecuted, demeaned, and even threatened with legal action for trying to live into who God has created them to be. So we have a ministry called Technicolor Ministries, led by one of our pastors, Katie Miles Wallace. And it's one way that we say to these siblings in Christ, in the kingdom of God, you are loved just for who you are. You matter for God, and you are welcome with no exceptions. And in San Antonio in September, a group of leaders from 15 different Lutheran congregations, including your own pastor, one of your pastors, met together to begin to imagine how God might be calling us right here in this city together to proclaim the good news of God's kingdom in different ways, in the midst of challenges such as hunger and houselessness and violence and poverty. And we'll be gathering here together again in January, and I'm grateful that you all, whether you knew it or not, will be hosting us as we continue to listen for where God is calling us and to take action together for the sake of this city that God loves. I'm excited to see where God might be leading us next. And I want to thank you once again for your partnership in the gospel as together we bear God's creative and redeeming world, word to all the world. Amen. <laughs>